Hello and welcome to the program. Prime Minister-elect Tony Abbott will this afternoon announce his ministerial lineup, and uh, in a surprise move, according to the Australian Financial Review, Arthur Sinodinos will be overlooked for cabinet. Uh, the report in the Fin Review suggests Matthias Cormann is set to become the new finance minister. And as we know, there's likely to be just one woman in the cabinet with the departure of Sophie Mirabella. That woman being Julie Bishop, the deputy Liberal leader and the foreign minister. I spoke to her a bit earlier this morning about the lack of female representation in the inner circle in Tony Abbott's cabinet. I expect that Tony will announce the cabinet at some time today and as he said um, throughout the election campaign he wants to maintain stability and the team that he took to the election was essentially going to be the team that he put into cabinet and the ministry. There will be some changes but uh, with Sophie Mirabella standing back from the cabinet position while her seat is still being determined, uh, there is one less woman in the cabinet. But there are other changes being made and we do have a wealth of talent in our party. With me on the program this morning, Labor MP Michelle Rowland and Liberal MP Steve Chobo in Brisbane. Steve Chobo, first to you. Um, on the Sinodinus issue, he's uh, a wealth of policy experience, seen as one of the best policy brains in the parliament, let alone the Liberal Party. Would, would that be a surprise to you if he's not made finance minister or not, not to elevated to cabinet? Uh, well, look, Kieran, I, I think with the media, it's uh, not always a case that you can believe what you read. I mean, time will tell. And look, the Prime Minister-elect, Tony Abbott, will make an announcement later on today. And, uh, and we'll see what the final composition is of the front bench. Uh, but I don't get too caught up in speculation. I certainly don't believe everything I read. Arthur Sinodinos is a valuable member of the team, has made an outstanding contribution both in his current role and uh, wearing previous caps. Uh, and I've no doubt he'll be a big part of the Coalition's future. Now, in terms of the female representation, uh, Michelle Rowland, we are expecting just one woman in the, in the Tony Abbott cabinet, but uh, th this is obviously due to the fact that Sophie Mirabella has, looks like she might lose her seat. And when you look at the, the, uh, the woman in the cabinet, she's pretty senior, the deputy Liberal leader. So is it a bit harsh to be going at Tony Abbott on the, the number of women in the cabinet when his deputy leader and foreign minister, one of the most senior in the government, is Julie Bishop? Oh, certainly, look, she is very senior, and that's a good thing. Um, but, yeah, I, I obviously don't know what the composition of the Cabinet's going to be. But I would find it uh, very surprising if, amongst the talent pool that the Liberal Party has, that it isn't able to find more women to fill those spots. I mean, there are a lot of very talented women uh, who have been around for some time with a wealth of experience. Um, I'm happy to name some of them. I was on a committee with Dr Sharman Stone during the last term. She's a former, uh, a former minister herself, very experienced. Um, I was always very impressed by Nola Marino, uh, who was one of the deputy whips and she has a really big policy interest in the area of cyber safety, for example. So I think there are plenty of very talented women who could go in there. Obviously, I don't know the result, but I think that uh, there are a lot of women in there who could do those roles. That, that's uh, a decent reference there from someone on the other side of the parliament, Steve Chobo, for a few of your female colleagues. Uh, well, look, you know, Kieran, I'm in furious agreement with Michelle, so let it not be said this program's only about division, Kieran. Uh, we do have, uh, <laughs> you know, all the women in the coalition, as I've said previously, uh, are outstanding. Uh, they're outstanding advocates for their local areas, and uh, I have no doubt that a large number of them will go on to make, you know, a, an amazing contribution on the coalition's front bench. Uh, ultimately, though, we don't know the final makeup of the front bench. Uh, I have no doubt there'll be a large number of women on the coalition's front bench, and, you know, this is a balancing act, Kieran, because at the same token, as uh, same time as well, we've got to make sure that we uh, have a strong, stable team, which has been a key part of the message that the Prime Minister-elect has said for some time now. Uh, we are very committed to stability, very committed to purposeful, methodical governance, uh, and that's what the last week has all been about, putting in place fundamental keystones that will hold this government uh, on a strong, stable footing, because ultimately that's in the best interest of our country. Yeah, that being said, though, stability um, is one thing, but if you have just one woman in the government's inner circle, that's a lot less than, for example, John Howard had in uh, his cabinet, let alone the, the subsequent Labor governments. Is, well, that, is that good enough in 2013 to have one woman in, in the cabinet of 20? 
Kieran, all I can say again is we haven't seen the final composition of the Cabinet. Uh, we have a large number of very talented women. Uh, we've got a large number of very talented men as well. Uh, ultimately, what we will see is the final composition will be released by the Prime Minister-elect later on today. Uh, and I have no doubt that the Australian people will form their own judgment uh, in due course. Michelle Rowland, what about the prospect of Bronwyn Bishop as Speaker? It looks like she will be the Speaker of the 44th Parliament with the strong endorsement of, uh, of the Prime Minister-elect Tony Abbott. Do you think she will do a, a good job and be, be fair and, uh, and independent, as Tony Abbott argues? She will. Oh, well, if, if that's the case, and it looks like uh, Bronwyn Bishop certainly is going to become Speaker, and I give anticipatory congratulations to her on that. I mean, I remember when I was uh, at high school in Parramatta, and Bronwyn Bishop was a senator, and she had her office in Parramatta. And I remember being involved in one of those, you know, students getting involved in government projects, and she was introduced to me as the person who was going to be the first female Prime Minister of Australia. Well, she didn't quite make it there, but she's going to become Speaker, which is um, an incredibly uh, important role and a, and a great honour for her. I'm sure she's very happy about that. Uh, but look, I think we need to remember too that uh, you know, the proof will be in, uh, in the deliberations that occur. We, obviously the 44th Parliament hasn't uh, sat yet, uh, but certainly I think that she, this is something that she obviously has wanted to do for a while. She's very interested in obviously the rules and uh, the processes of Parliament, so congratulations to her. As a journalist, I've got to say, Steve Chobo, the prospect of Bronwyn Bishop v Clive Palmer <laughs> would be... <laughs> Would, would be a, a one to look forward to. Well, you know, look, I think that um, Bronwyn will make an outstanding speaker. I have no doubt about that. I think anybody who's watched Question Time over the last, well, let's face it, Kieran, over, over the last decade or more uh, would understand what a contribution Bronwyn Bishop uh, has to make. Uh, I think she brings to the role uh, a certain amount of gravitas. I think that she brings a certain amount of dignity and, and look frankly it needs it. I mean you know a lot of people tried to airbrush out uh, what was a pretty squalid period uh, when it came to the speakership over the past couple of years. Uh, there were some you know, knee-jerk quick reactions that the previous Labor government made because it was politically convenient for them to choose to, for example, put Peter Slipper into the speaker's role. Uh, now we just want to push all of that behind us. We're a new government. We're focused on a positive future. We're focused on bringing dignity back to the parliament. And I think that Bromman Bishop will be a key part of achieving that outcome. That's, that'd be good for everyone, wouldn't it, Michelle Rowland, to, to have uh, that dignity that Steve referred to, Bronwyn Bishop and Tony Abbott have all used that, that word as well. That'd be a good thing for the Parliament. Well, certainly, but equally we shouldn't be airbrushing uh, some of the, the realities of what the 43rd Parliament was. It was a hung Parliament, a hung Parliament in which people behaved very badly uh, during uh, a lot of the parliamentary processes. And look, uh, Mrs Bishop was no stranger to that. I don't know how many times she got booted out of the Parliament, but it was more than once. And uh, you know, we talk about bringing dignity to the Parliament. I'm all for that. Uh, even if you know, Steve wants to airbrush out some of the antics that went on from his side in the 43rd. But certainly I'm very ready to move on. I was never... I, I don't intend to get booted out under Bronwyn Bishop, so I will make sure that I'm very well behaved and follow the standing orders accordingly. But I don't think we should, you know, we shouldn't be airbrushing out anything that happened on Steve's side of the chamber that contributed to the dignity of the parliament uh, certainly uh, being lessened. Well, that, I have had a bit of reaction along those lines, Steve Chobo, from uh, various correspondents on email and Twitter this morning saying, well, what about the coalition's contribution to the chaos of the hung parliament? Is it a bit rich now for the coalition to be taking the moral high ground when you, you had your fair share of responsibility for uh, the, the behaviour of the last parliament? Uh, you know, Kieran, I think Parliament is a robust vehicle. The reality is that we have an adversarial system. There's a government, there's an opposition. The job of the opposition is to hold the government to account. I mean, we have an adversarial system. Don't think for one second that I'm saying that there's going to be nothing but peace, love and tranquility. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Uh, it is going to continue to be a robust debating chamber, as it should be. But I think there's a difference between robust debate uh, and, you know, and the fact that people are after this sort of nirvana of, of, of uh, debate. That's not going to happen. Bronwyn Bishop is going to be even-handed. Uh, she brings a wealth, decades of experience to the role. Uh, and I think, as I said, that important personal role of gravitas that Bronwyn Bishop has as well, I think, will help to make a difference. But look, you know, Michelle and I can start a new benchmark this morning, Kieran. We're, we're bringing the right spirit to this morning's discussion, and, uh, and long may yeah. it continue. Peace, love and tranquility. Maybe we can move the <laughs> parliament to Byron Bay. That might, uh, that might help out. <laughs>
Now, Ian McDonald has issued a statement, Steve Chubb. I suppose this is a sign of, you know, being in government now. Tony Abbott's got to go and anger a few people. He certainly angered your LNP colleague, um, Ian McDonald. He says... Uh, in a statement, I'll just read a little bit of it to you and our viewers that might not have caught up with it. He says, what should have been one of the proudest days of my life has turned into one of the worst. The ecstasy of a new government and success in the, the North has turned a little sad with a phone call from Tony Abbott saying he has no room for me in the new ministry. Um, McDonald bows out is, is the headline of the, the statement. It's, um, yeah... Uh, as I say, it's a sign that being in government, you are going to annoy a few people. He's certainly done that with Ian McDonald on the way out of the front bench. Uh, well, Kieran, look, I've been on the receiving end of one of those phone calls and they're not pleasant. Um, the reality is that, uh, you know, it, it does hurt uh, to be a recipient of one of the phone calls when you're told, well, look, your contribution uh, isn't going to be on the front bench. But uh, Ian has been a big contributor for a number of years uh, and there's reports today about others. I mean, I don't want to get too caught up in the speculation. Uh, the coalition is new to government. We're going to make sure that we govern uh, for all Australians. Uh, the Prime Minister-elect, Tony Abbott, has said time and time again now. This is about a purposeful, methodical approach to governance. Uh, he's going to make a decision and an assessment about uh, which team is best placed to take the coalition forward and to serve the people of Australia. Uh, that will mean that there are some hard calls to be made. Uh, and I think all of us in, in parliamentary politics understand uh, that sometimes it breaks your way, sometimes it doesn't break your way, uh, but you've just got to suck it up, move on uh, and be an active and, and positive contributor. Michelle Rowland, any thoughts on that before we go to the break? I suppose that's just the nature of, of new governments and, uh, and ministerial lineups, isn't it? Well, look, from what I've heard on the news, you know, some, pe some other people are going to be disappointed too. I heard, and I'm willing to be corrected, but I thought I heard a report that um, Teresa Gambaro wasn't going to um, keep her spot either. She must be That's very right. disappointed considering that she held on in Brisbane, which was the most marginal Liberal seat, so she's obviously going to be disappointed too. Yep, there will be a few others, and I'm also told Don Randall, Andrew Southcott, and uh, Ian McDonald, along with Theresa Gambaro, also Connie a fear of Auntie Wells to be demoted apparently as well. But there will be some promotions. Liberal Senator Michaelia Cash is going to enter the ministry, I'm told. Also Nationals Fiona, uh, Fiona Nash and the Kelly O'Dwyer to be promoted to Parliamentary Secretary, um, according to my sources this morning. Anyway, we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back with Steve Chobo and Michelle Rowland. Why? Why? BD? Ah! Man, I hate it when you just appear like that. A trillion pardons, Dave. What's up? This car insurance renewal, that's what's up. Well, I switched to Budget Direct, got a 10% online discount, and saved hundreds of your Earth dollars. Really? Customers told us they saved on average $238 when they switched to Budget Direct's award-winning car insurance. Get smart. Get direct. Budget Direct. Dave! Ah! Smarter deal. Some friends of mine were internet dating. We started talking about it. I'd never been conscious of what I was looking for. So far, eHarmony has worked very well in terms of matching me with people who have a similar outlook. Every person I've been matched with and every person I've met, they've all been really compatible. So yeah, I would recommend eHarmony to friends. I already have recommended eHarmony to quite a lot of my friends. Review all your matches for free at eHarmony.com.au. The ING Direct Everyday Bank Account is one of a kind. It's the only bank account to give you fee-free access to every ATM in Australia. Because wherever you are, withdraw $200 or more and we'll pay the ATM fees. Spend your life well with an ING Direct Everyday Bank Account. New Palmolive Eye Ritual Shower Gels, inspired by Indian Ayurvedic rituals. This isn't just your shower, this is your sanctuary. Palmolive Eye Ritual, find your sanctuary. What are you doing right now? Why not head off for a spur of the moment ski trip? A night at the theater? or impromptu fine dining. Live spontaneously in a new Renault Megane. Visit madeforthemoment.com.au today.
When the world makes your eyes dry and irritated, it's often because their protective moisture layer is damaged. Now there's an amazing new way to relieve your discomfort. New Optrex Actimist Eye Spray. Unlike eye drops, you spray it on closed eyes. The droplets spread over the protective layer, restoring natural moisture in the blink of an eye. Relieving dry eyes is now so easy, you can do it with your eyes closed. Try new Optrex Actimist Eye Spray. Oh, there you are. This is my little mate, Lockie. When we first met, we just seemed to click. Lockie's job is to lock hundreds of prices down all over the store. So look for the lock and say, That's settle down, mate. Like This is AIM Agenda with me this morning, Michelle Rowland and Steve Chobo. Now, the election's done and dusted, but the Labor leadership continues to be an issue, of course, with this contest now between Anthony Albanese and Bill Shorten over the next month. Both men were out there campaigning already with the, the Labor Party faithful. Of course, the rank and file will have a big say as to who the next Labor leader will be. This opportunity for Labor to show that we're inclusive, that we're open, that we're not frightened of debating ideas. Uh, if this is done right, this can give us enormous momentum. It's about the three Ps, the party, the policy, the people. If I was given the honour of representing and leading the Labor Party, first of all, I'd work on the party. We need to be a team. Michelle Rowland, to you, is this a healthy process or is it a debacle, the fact that you're not going to have a, a leader, a vacuum for more than a month? Well, firstly, we do have an interim leader and that's Chris Bowen and um, I'm delighted for Chris that he's um, assumed that role um, for even an interim period. Uh, but I think that it's very important to get this right and I really welcome it. I've been someone who's very much supported more grassroots involvement in our party and certainly grassroots involvement in choosing our leader. And when I went around uh, to my local branches, I was at one yesterday, there is tremendous enthusiasm for this process. And I think that it's very important uh, as was said um, by I think both um, Albo and uh, Bill Shorten, that we need to get this right. And I'm very pleased uh, that we've got this happening uh, and I welcome it and the party welcomes it. And I think that whilst we undergo uh, this process, we will have more people getting involved. We'll have an opportunity for party members to interrogate uh, who would be their leaders. And most importantly, I think that there'll be much more of an ownership um, of the leadership of the Labor Party because we often hear people say, you know, the party um, is bigger than all of us. It's not about the individual. It's about the movement. It's about the ideals. I think that this um, really puts uh, meat on the bone uh, to that saying and, and I welcome it. Michelle Rowland, in terms of the, uh, well, the, the rules though, they, I suppose you can break them up into the, those two elements. There's the rank and file component, but then there's also the changes to the, the way that the caucus vote um, happens. And if, you know, in the event of a, a poor performing leader, that you need uh, upwards of, uh, I think it was more than two, two thirds or three quarters of the caucus to vote against a, a, a sitting, a, a, an incumbent. Now, Julia Gillard, in her first intervention after the election, says she does not support that. Um, what, what do you make of Julia Gillard's intervention on that, the fact that she's not uh, very supportive of of that particular component of the new rules? Look, I certainly support and I welcome um, former Prime Minister Gillard's um, words that she has uh, penned recently. They were very thoughtful and I certainly took a lot away from them. On this particular point about the rules change, I, I respectfully disagree. Uh, I do think that this is certainly uncharted territory for the Labor Party, but it's territory that does need to be charted. And certainly we don't know um, how it's going to work in practice because we've never done it before. We don't have a precedent for it. But I don't think that that's an argument in and of itself to not go through it. Chris Bowen, the interim leader, was on the, the Australian Agenda program with Peter Van Onselen yesterday. Let's have a listen to a little of what, what he had to say on this. I think that, again, Kevin Rudd was entitled uh, to accept the request of the party to return to the leadership, just as Julia Gillard was entitled in 2010 to put her case forward that she was a better candidate uh, to lead the Labor Party in 2010, quite close to a federal election. But I do think going forward, and this moves to the next topic perhaps, I do think going forward the Labor Party needs to embrace a culture of uh, legitimacy and stability for its leaders. 
Yeah, there you go. So talking about that need to embrace uh, stability, I suppose that's what those rules are trying to underpin. Uh, Steve Chobo, in terms of democratising the party processes, there are, there are many that believe that uh, it's inevitable that Australian parties have to do this. It's something that, that um, the political parties do right around the world, you know, from the United States with their primaries to the UK with their, their Labor sure. leadership processes. Canada's got the same the same thing for their progressive party. So it's not a it's not a new thing. Is isn't it a good good thing to let the rank and file have a have a say in these matters? Well, I'd make two points about this, Kieran. Uh, the first is um, with respect to the process happening within Labor. I mean, I, I think that you've got to make sure that whilst process is important, it's also about culture. And what's crystal clear is that within the Labor Party there continues to be a problematic culture. I mean when Julie Gillard was Prime Minister, you know, you had Kevin Rudd chipping in. Uh, when Kevin Rudd became Prime Minister, you had Julie Gillard chi uh, chiming in. Uh, now, neither of them is Prime Minister, and you've still got Julie Gillard chiming in over the top of new leaders. Uh, you've got Chris Bowen, who's captain of the ship currently, but that'll probably change to become uh, Bill Shorten or Anthony Albanese. I mean, the reality is that we don't really know uh, who's going to be leading the Labor Party, but we do know culturally there's going to be a problem. Uh, in addition to that, within the Liberal Party, the issue that we've got here is that we have a plebiscite site system that applies to selecting and pre-selecting local members. Michelle Rowland, do you think it's a, something you can learn from the Liberal Party, the discipline that they've shown over the last couple of years that, you know, look at Tony Abbott and the way he's performed and the discipline his party has given to him, is that something Labor needs to to learn from? Well firstly I'll respond to Steve. Look, I keep hearing Steve and others say you know the adults are in charge again talking with a lot of adverbs and adjectives about how they're going to govern. Mate don't worry about us all right you're in government now don't worry about us you know we don't need commentary from Steve or anyone else about how our pre-selection processes work or how our uh, leadership processes work. You know, put that aside uh, but I certainly think the lessons have been learnt and they've been learnt very hard by Labor. Let's make Make no bones about it. I mean, even when you look in New South Wales, uh, gee, the, the public really jumped on board when we had a revolving uh, leadership of the, the New South Wales um, government uh, uh, for a couple of years. So I think the lesson has been sorely learnt and I think there can be no better way of making sure that that doesn't happen again, either at a state or a federal level, than to have rank and file ownership, at least 50%, which is what is being done with these rule changes, but to have real ownership, to actually embrace people outside the party, people who believe in our values, and to bring them on board. And, you know, again, I'll just say to Steve, you know, his last comment was that they, you know, have a pre-selection process. Well, you worry about yours, and uh, we're quite fine, thanks very much, with our pre-selection processes as they are. Now, finally, Tony Burke says that you should be a front bench uh, candidate. You should be on the, the, take on a more prominent role, Michelle Rowland, in the, in the Labor Party over the next term. Do you, would you welcome that? Look, I welcome any opportunity to contribute um, to the party uh, and I welcome any opportunity to contribute to that in a, a federal parliamentary Labor Party sphere. But Kieran, look, I've been around for 23 years in this and you know, I know that there are many contributions I can make in different ways. But first and foremost, I've been out, out and about in the last week. I made sure that Monday I was doing a mobile office and I had a, a full weekend's um, agenda of activities in my community. And time okay. and again, people were coming up to me saying why they voted for me. And they voted for me because I was out in my community, I was involved and I was one of them. And whatever I do in the party, I'm going to make sure that that is not diminished. Well, thanks for being involved this morning, Michelle Rowland and Steve Chobo to you as well. We'll see you soon.